compelling detective story, a cloak and dagger action and a romantic drama, all these stories were taken from real life. The history of Kazakhstan is inseparable from the world history. Reflections on history, our version. An optimist's journey. It seemed that she had no alternative but to take care of herself. However, she wasn't used to giving in. She was in England in the 1860s. She remembered the time when they had been together and happy in spite of everything. There were three of them, Alatau, her famous husband, and herself. The scientific and artistic results of those travels are contained in the two volumes which she published in his lifetime. But there's little allusion to them in the adventures we encountered during those journeys. And especially there's no mention of the strange incidents which befell myself, often left alone holding an infant. The woman signed and wrote the title, Recollections of Tartar Steppes and Their Inhabitants by Lucy Atkinson, with a quill pen. She writes it in the form of a series of letters to a friend. So she's writing uh, the date and the place, and then she's writing, this is what happened. She didn't use her imagination, only described what she had seen. In her work, she used women's intuition and vision of what was happening. They even gave their son, who was born during that journey, the name of our famous mountains. Chapter 1, Adventurer and Governess. Thomas Atkinson was one of the notorious adventurers traveling in the vast areas of Central Asia and Kazakhstan in the 19th century. Besides this, he was also an architect, artist, writer, and supposedly a spy. Thomas Atkinson arrived in St. Petersburg and people said that he even attended a reception given by Nicholas I. At Count Marafiov's, he met his destined wife, Lucy, who was a governess there. Their honeymoon continued for years. They went to Siberia and Kyrgyz and Kaisatsk steppes. Who else would agree to it? Nevertheless, she did. Lucy's married name was Sharand Finley Atkinson. As for her marriage, it turned out to be connected to a strange and unpleasant story. But Lucy found out about it only after her husband's death. Being one of a large family, it became my duty, at an early period of life, to seek support by my own exertions. I accordingly betook myself to St. Petersburg, where for eight years I remained in the family of General Murafiov, superintending the education of his only daughter. In 1846, I became acquainted with Mr. Atkinson, then about to proceed on his travels into Siberia, and on his return after the lapse of a year, I was married to him. It's difficult to say if their marriage was the result of mutual love or not. However, it was obvious that he left a deep impression on her. Thomas was very good at creating an impression in society, and moreover in different societies. Lucy was 27, and it was unlikely that she could find a good husband. Although she wasn't beautiful, she was attractive, had a strong character, sense of humor, and tremendous optimism. Only a few women would make a decision to go on a seven-year journey to unknown places. So she was not an experienced traveler, but she spoke good Russian. Thomas didn't really speak, at the beginning he didn't speak much Russian, so she was very important. In early 1847, the newly married couple started their journey. They went from St. Petersburg to Barnaul, then crossed Altai and reached the steppe. It's very difficult to follow the couple's exact route using their books. Among expedition members, there were three Cossacks and local guides, but they constantly replaced each other. They rode horses and camels during the journey. The first Kazakhstan city mentioned by Lucy was Semipalatinsk. She provided local information which was connected to certain people, events, features and details of life. Thus, she was a real researcher. She provides a very accurate time frame. 
This is different to Thomas. Thomas is very vague about dates. Chapter two, woman's vision of Lucy Atkinson. Approaching Semipalatinsk, the English traveler met a cattle dealer who was driving 300 horses, 7,000 cows, and 20,000 sheep for sale. Atkinson was astonished at the fact that the total cost of the cattle amounted to 100,000 rubles. But Atkinson liked fibbing. In the book by Lucy, there's no information about any cattle dealers, and she wrote only a few lines about staying in Semipalatins, saying that the head of the district took them to merchants who lived in Tartar community, and the English guests were shown many beautiful things from China. This phrase is quoted from the book. Then the English guests visited the school for Tartar girls who sang prayers. That was all. Although Atkinson was in Semipalatinsk, documentary evidence proving this fact hasn't been found yet, as well as the pictures drawn here. We can say that this area remains a blank spot still. There are quite a lot of blank spots in the married couple's journey. It's known that the Atkinsons went from Semipalatinsk to Ayaguz, where they were heartily welcomed. Lucy was surprised that they were even treated to coffee, which was very expensive at that time. For Maya Guz, they went to a Kazakh village, and Lucy was surprised by the expanse of the steppe and generous hospitality. A yurt was put up specially for them near a spring, and Bukhara carpets were laid on the floor. Lucy wrote that it was very luxurious. Tea being ready, we sat down to partake of the refreshing beverage. Amongst the Kyrgyz, it's not accompanied by bread and butter, as with us, but by dried fruits served up on magnificent china plates. We had a number of visitors who came to watch our mode of eating. Our slightest movements seemed to interest them. They looked at us with scrutinizing glances. The other party cast curious glances too. Lucy described men and women's clothes in detail, saying that they were beautiful. She was also surprised that they milked sheep and found it strange. Unlike her husband, Mrs. Atkinson was more interested in the way of life and relationships. You can find similar information which is more detailed and various in notes and also in documents of that period. However, Lucy reveals that side of life and of the steppe and its inhabitants which was not included in any official or diplomatic documents. They are a peculiar race of people, being able to remain two and some three days without eating. And then the quantity they can eat is enormous. I was told that a man can eat a sheep at once. On making the inquiry among the Kyrgyz, one of them offered to treat me with the sight if I would pay for it, but I declined witnessing. They could say anything, even that they would eat a whole sheep, and she became alarmed. Oh my God, what will happen now? Actually, they just teased her and made jokes. They experienced all the delights of steppe life, starting from sumptuous feasts in Kazakh villages to hunger. Lucy lost weight significantly during the journey. Sometimes they ate only crumbs of crackers for weeks. Mr. Atkinson put them in boiling water and cooked something similar to soup. Sometimes they had only wild apples for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. The travelers baked them like potatoes in ashes. Nevertheless, Lucy was often worried about different problems. For instance, she wrote that a ball was held to mark their arrival, but she had only one dress, which was not at all suitable for the reception. Chapter 3, Alatau Tamshibulak. I cannot forbear mentioning the daughters of Bek Sultan, two beautiful girls. The youngest was more to my taste, being very pretty. She was slim and exceedingly graceful in all of her movements. Her elder sister was a perfect Amazon. She placed her hand on the saddle and vaulted into it without the slightest effort. And then to see her on horseback was a beautiful sight. She sat on the animal so gracefully. I envied her this accomplishment, said Lucy. Here we can see a woman's vision in a spy story, or perhaps it was just the journey of an optimist. Sit back. 
looking at Thomas Atkinson's drawings, we can try imagining those distant days. The road wasn't easy. They had to sleep on wet ground, often in the pouring rain without a shelter. They went along dangerous passages through mountain rivers and snowy passes. Several times she was on the verge of death. About two o'clock in the morning, I could go no farther without rest. I was likewise so cold that I could scarcely hold the reins of my horse, as there was a cutting wind blowing from the snowy mountains. I now dismounted, trembling with cold, having nothing on me but my dress, my warm jacket having been lost that day, coming unstrapped from my saddle. They gave me a bear's skin to lie down on, and my husband's fur coat to cover me. They had to overcome cold, thirst, and hunger. In addition, they were afraid of gangsters who made repeated attempts to attack them. Lucy was able to protect herself and handled a rifle to protect not only her life, but also the life of her husband. Although she was pregnant, she continued doing it. It was a fantastic achievement because she was in the, in the saddle riding for more than seven months pr when she was pregnant. It's hard to understand how she could do this. She, was, she must have been a very strong woman. Moreover, during the first months of their journey, Lucy had to conceal that she was pregnant. It's unknown why she did it, but perhaps it was her husband's demand. They passed through Jaizan, foothills of trans Ili Alatau, and finally at the end of September 1848, the travelers arrived in Kapal, and Lucy wrote that a few days later, a little event occurred in their family. She gave birth to their son here, in our Kazakhstan, and she was charmed by the beauty of Kazakhstan and its mountains. He was named Alatau. A doctor in Kapal said that premature birth had been caused by the long time she had spent riding. He was born at seven months, which wasn't surprising taking into account such a journey. What was surprising was that he had been born and survived. Another name of Alatau is Tam Shimbulak, a life-giving spring near which he was born. However, Lucy and Thomas's son deserves his own story, as his destiny was also unusual. The Atkinsons spent a few months in Kapal. First they lived in a yurt, and then in a little house. After that, they continued their journey with six-month-old Alatau. We had farewell visits from many of our Kyrgyz friends. Amongst the foremost was the old Sultan Souk, with whom I was a great favorite, who bade me tell my husband not to fatigue me so much by taking me with him the next time he visited the steppe, as he would give him any number of wives he liked. At the same time, he should always be pleased to see me. Epilogue from Lucy with Love. In seven years, their honeymoon was finished. Thomas wrote two books based on it, but didn't mention either Lucy or their son in them. It could be because many people thought that it had been a spy mission, or because the glory of the fearless traveler diminished to a certain extent when compared with his wives. There were some nuances. Perhaps they were individual features of the personality of that man. We might not find it necessary to mention a woman's contribution or thought perhaps that it was inappropriate. According to other sources, there were different reasons. They say that after Thomas died, they found out that his first wife was still alive and Lucy couldn't be Mr. Atkinson's heir. For this reason, they had to write recollections about the journey to distant Kazakh steppes in order to improve her financial situation. Anyway, Lucy wrote only good things about Thomas. Lucy says that this is a man who I loved and trusted, and that he was always truthful and honest to me. This is what she says. She paints a portrait of a very benign man, of a very uh, good man, somebody who looked after her. Notes about the Tatar steppe and its inhabitants were published two years after Thomas's death in 1863. It's easy to read this book because it's full of gentle humor and great optimism. In spite of the difficult journey, Lucy Atkinson showed warmth and love writing about our land. The bidding farewell is always a sad feeling, and this I felt when we reached a point in the steppe where I saw for the last time the white peaks of the Alatau and Aktau rearing their lofty heads far into the clear blue sky. I was loath to leave them, 
and when I did so, I couldn't restrain a tear from starting to my eyes.